Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Monday, March 7th, 2022. Once again, I am delighted to be back with Professor Barry Simon. Barry, it's good to be with you again. Likewise, been a little, been a while. And I want to say for the for the record, we are re-meeting today because of the the depth and the breadth of our conversations. There were just a few loose threads that we've come together to put together to make everything one cohesive, wonderful transcript. Plus so, one item that we discussed very briefly, and there were developments after the final that may just make a great story. That's right. Hot off the press. It's the thing I'm, I'm going to use for my standard talk probably for the next year. Okay. Barry, the first item is going back to your Princeton days. We talked about the graduate student and the bomb threat. We did not talk about the one who claimed to have taken out a contract on your life. So I've got to hear this story. What so was that I, all about? Well, as I mentioned at the time when we discussed the bomb threat guy, there were there were a number of students. And what was interesting is that almost all the serious issues happened the first year I was director of graduate studies. Um, the, the bomb threat guy, that's when the Witten story took place. Um, and the story I'm about to tell you began then. So Johnny Wheeler, so there were two people, um, one in math, one in physics, who had reputations of being um, talent finders, talent scouts, particularly good at identifying people who otherwise fell through the cracks. That was Johnny Wheeler and Ralph Fox in math. And they were really very good, no question about it. And Johnny had an Italian postdoc who liked to pretend he was the next Johnny Wheeler, not that anyone could be the next Johnny Wheeler. And uh, he decided to find his own talent. He was visiting Trieste and heard about some guy who was some young guy who was still actually in college in Yugoslavia, but who visited briefly and impressed this postdoc. And he managed to convince Johnny that this was a great talent. And there's no doubt that this postdoc on his own couldn't have gotten by, you know, the, the, accept, the rules making an exception to the standard kind of application procedure. But he convinced Johnny, and of course, Johnny walked on water as far as everyone was concerned. And I was this, this admission took place the year that I was on leave, but he started the first year I was. Uh, uh, Director of Graduate Studies, and I didn't pay much attention to him initially. But a couple of weeks into the term, one of our experimental particle physics physicists, who was quite excitable, came to see me all upset and concerned. Virtually all the first year students that didn't have NSFs um, worked as, as um, uh, research assistants in experimental projects, because that was where there was more, more uh, grant money available. And it was considered a good way, but, you know, even if you're a theorist, you should see some experiment. And this young guy decided, I'm a great theorist. I'm not, you know, I'm too good to waste my time with experiment. And so he refused to do anything. And, you know, my guess is some of my other colleagues would have shrugged and complained a little bit. This you know, I can't pay him. Ever. And so I had this real problem. And I essentially wanted to lay down the law, but, but uh, this was a complicated enough case. I went to see Merv, who was the department chair, Merv Goldberger, and uh, we discussed what to do. And Murph, on these kinds of questions, had more wisdom and sensitivity than I did. I was a young guy then. I, I like to think in my older age, I grew a little more sensitive. And so he said, no, no, this is a young guy. He's away from home. Let's give him a little slack. I'll find some money to pay for him for this quarter. Okay. Now, as background, I should tell you that the, the problem was this guy did not have a very good background, although we didn't realize that. He actually talked a good game, but really didn't play a good game. We didn't know any of that. Um, 
And Murph arranged that the second quarter, he actually was a research assistant for Johnny Wheeler, in fact. In fact, I think it may have actually been that Murph didn't find his own money. Murph said, Johnny got us into this. We'll let him pay for it. I think that's actually what happened, Mother. And then at the end of the year, he said, you know, I'm too good. I shouldn't have to take any of your exams. And he refused to take out qualifying exam that people have to take at the end of the first year. And again, I wanted to throw the book at him. But Murph said, well, we should give him a little slack. And so Murph kept wanting to give him slack. And the second year, um, there was a final place and I went to see Murph. Murph said, wait, this should probably be the last one. And I said, yeah, Murph, this is the last one. I won't accept, you know, this is the last exception. And so I sent him a strongly worded message that, you know, we, this was the last exception we were making. He'd better be prepared to take the general exam at the uh, end of the year. And if he didn't want to, he should just go back to uh, Montenegro. And I probably should have been written a more tempered message, um, but he was terribly insulted and was fairly unstable as you hear during the story, as the story develops. I didn't think I appreciated all this. He was clearly an excitable guy. And uh, he had been encouraged at some point to see some uh, a psychiatrist on Princeton Health Services, and he'd been seeing him. And um, he at one point began to make threats to the psychiatrist of suicide. And I think that both the psychiatrist and the dean who the psychiatrist reported to were not very professional, and the word came back that not only did he threaten to commit suicide, but he said the only reason he wanted to commit suicide is if he killed himself because I had impringed his honor. He had all these relatives back, back in Montenegro whose duty it would then be to come and kill me to make up for the fact that I forced him because I besmirched his honor to commit suicide. And these things, guys. But this is something that sometimes happen, happens in academia. It's something we, you don't realize when you get involved in academia. And uh, I can't remember exactly when in the process, but I think it was not more than about a month later. I get a call from this assistant graduate dean um, who had been dealing with him who was very upset and concerned that the student had been in his office and had told the dean that he was um, so, can, so upset with me that he had gone to Trenton and paid $5,000 to have a contract taken out on my life. Now, he, by the way, also expressed a great deal of um, animosity towards Johnny, who he felt had also insulted him. And at some point, one of the psychiatrists involved had said, you know, the real problem is that he hates his father. And because the two people on the Princeton faculty he um, admires the most are you and Johnny Wheeler, really, you sort of substitute father figures. And so since he hates his father, he wants to. So this was not something one ignored exactly. I, of course, went to see Murph. There were lots of developments, some of which in retrospect are a little bit amusing, although given the final stages of the story are not so uh, amusing. Barry, did you detect an anti-Semitic angle at all here? No, not. Not at all. In fact, he may have been Jewish. I don't remember, but he may have been Jewish. I just don't remember for sure. Um, no, not not even a slight element of that. So one thing that happened, it was, it was this Keystone Cops episode, 
So I don't know how much you know about Princeton, but uh, traditionally, Princeton is the borough of Princeton, which is Nassau Street and the area around Nassau Street. And then the surrounding area of Princeton Township. And at some point, Murph decided he should contact the Princeton police because making a threat like this against the Batman was very serious. And so we had a, a Jadwin Hall, which is where the physics department was at the time, and it still is, um, is in Princeton Township. He contacted township police. And we talked for quite a while. And then at some point, the Princeton cop says, oh, my goodness, this threat. And he was very serious about the threat. He said, the threat took place in Nassau Hall. That's in the borough. We can't get involved. <laughs> so who could? Well, I, we did get the borough involved, but they decided they couldn't. It was just a thread. It wasn't the, 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 until something really happened. I, the other thing that, again, was a, at least calmed me down a little. The head of, we also contacted Princeton Security, and the head of Princeton Security said, you know, I, I don't think this thread is serious, and I'll tell you why. $5,000 is the wrong amount. If he wanted to get, a, you know, he went down and just found someone who agreed to do a contract, whether he do it or not, it wouldn't cost more than $500. There's no way it would cost $5,000. And if he wanted to get a high class, you know, something that would really get done, it would be $50,000. $5,000, just not the right amount. So I think he made it all up. Well, that sort of died down, but he refused to take his general exam and was essentially um, terminated, stopped being a student, um, but hung around Princeton. And he no longer had a student visa, and Murph consulted someone in... Um, uh, Princeton, who dealt with immigration. And the word came back from someone in immigration that, well, we could pick him up and bring him to Newark, but before, before the paperwork was dry, he'd be out and there was nothing we could do. The current policies are such that we don't really follow up on cases like this. That's the way things were about immigration in 1973. Four, this was probably, and he for a while I think was, um, he was sleeping on John Milner's floor, the floor in John Milner's apartment. He started hanging around the institute, and you know Milner was a sweet guy. And at some point, due to some pressure from someone at the institute, he was allowed to take. I only heard about this indirectly he was allowed to take some kind of oral exam which of course i had nothing to do with and he did just he, he didn't know anything so and so it sort of died away until um after i was at caltech so the original thing was 374 uh, in 1983, I came back to Princeton because my advisor, Arthur Whiteman, had his a 60th birthday conference. And he was again showing up on campus making threats against me because he knew I was coming back. I know Murph would got so concerned at Caltech, he actually would consult with the FBI, who didn't do anything. And, you know, I remember I essentially had a, a, a Princeton security bodyguard with me the entire time I was at this. And then I went back to, to Caltech. And about a year later, we heard that he had walked in to some police office in either Trenton or... Um, 
Princeton and claimed to have put cyanide lace tea bags on a shelf in a supermarket in Trenton. And indeed, he'd done that. And he wound up in prison. And when he was released, by then it was such that he was deported. So it ended rather sadly. And, you know, it's the indication of, I mean, there are cases, of course, where the violence happens. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are celebrated cases. It's, it's, an, it's a sad side of, um, academia and as we said the fact that you often have students who um are unstable were you ever legitimately concerned for your safety for the first probably week after i heard about the threat you bet i mean i was urged that i consulted a uh uh, you know, I lived in Edison, not in Princeton, because of the Jewish community. I consulted a cop there. I remember he, it was a very different reaction from the Princeton who were, because he had he had apparently spent a year on the Washington police force where he'd been in the area that contained the Yugoslavian embassy. And he did not have a very positive view of Yugoslavians. So he was, and you know, he was he was therefore very concerned. He thought it might be, and was, yeah, I was a little concerned, and I was not I was not unconcerned when I went back for Arthur Whiteman's. I remember, you know, he actually showed up uh, at some public lecture during the conference, and he walked in, and I remember feeling threatened. He walked in, yeah. Did you tell your wife about this and did she let you go into work? Um, certainly I told my wife. There's no way I wouldn't tell my wife. Um, yeah, I don't think. You know, the problem was that probably Princeton campus was safer than my house in Edison. Why, <laughs> why should she not let me go into work? <laughs> And you mentioned Murph. What about up the chain at Princeton? Did you get support from administration? Um, I don't think, you know, there was just the only one I remember dealing with all the course, security who got involved. No other administrators were really involved. I remember one case where I didn't get support. There was some point when, you know, every once in a while there would be a flare up and make more threats. And I don't remember all the details, but I remember being very disappointed in my colleagues. There was some point where there was a sequence of threats. And I actually wanted him to be made persona non grata on campus. He didn't be allowed on campus. And I don't know why this came to a physics department meeting, but it did. And my idiot colleagues decided, well, since he just threatened and hadn't done anything, how could we not let him on campus? And so it wasn't, the vote was close, but it was in fact not, it was taken not to, uh, and I felt not supported by my colleagues. Yeah. Well, Barry, while we're on the topic of, of Murph, we st talked a little bit about the, the draft for Vietnam, didn't return to it, Tell me about the draft board in Murph. What was the story there? Okay, so, um, of course, I, as a little background, I should mention the, uh, I was very much against the Vietnam War, like almost all of my contemporaries, uh, starting as a graduate student through the essentially ceasefire. Um, and draft was an issue both as a graduate student and as a faculty member. So as a graduate student, I, I mentioned the story about the lame, the halt, the blind. 
There was some tightening of graduate student deferments, but I think because I had an NSF fellowship, I don't remember the reasons. I had no problem getting a uh, deferment, a 2S, as a graduate student. My first year when I was an instructor at Princeton, we applied for a 2S. And this was a, a 2A, which is the occupational deferment. And this was a point when they eliminated student deferments, is my memory. And whoever wrote the letter for faculty, for young faculty at Princeton, it was not a very good letter. And when I looked at it, I said, it sounded as if they were actually trying to take graduate teaching assistants and turn them into employees. It, wasn't, it was not a very good letter. And in fact, I got classified 1A, which meant, um, I think that was probably just before the um, the lottery. So it, it, independent of birthday, I would have been eligible to be drafted. But there was an appeal period and I went to see Murph. Now, Murph, you should know, was even more strongly against the war than most people I know. Uh, my first really vivid memory of Murph is I actually took a course with him as a graduate student. And he had teaching, he had postdocs take almost all his lectures. He would come back and give a lecture occasionally and would apologize for missing class. But essentially he said, well, I have contacts in Washington and so I'm spending all my time there trying to get us out of this stupid war. And Murph under Johnson, maybe under Kennedy, was, was on PSAC, the President's Scientific Advisory Commission. Um, and in later years, he was quite active, as you may know, with uh, the Defense Department. He ran a, a summer uh, thing doing DOD research. Um, and so he had lots of contacts. And he was this. And so I told, you know, I told Murph I'd been classified 1A and that I was appealing. He said, don't worry, I'll write them a letter. I know how to write a letter. Literally one week later, you know, the appeals process, I think we were told that, you, you know, it, normally it's negative and it takes about three months. One week later, I get reclassified 2A with a note on the reclassification letter saying, Please be sure to have your employer write us again next year so we can continue your deferment. So Murph obviously wrote a letter that explained how vital my research was for national defense. <laughs> and this is, this is a second part of the story that I don't remember quite all the details. But, and I'm trying to remember now the original thing probably happened, so I, it happened when I was an instructor, so probably at the point before I was married. Um, and the second thing I know happened when I was already an assistant professor. So it's possible it was while I was engaged, but probably after I was married. I did get reclassified, but I began to feel very guilty about, you know, all my contemporaries or many of my contemporaries were in this terrible draft system forced to go fight in a war that they didn't believe in. And so I actually contemplated um, going to Canada. I don't remember whether it was that I was going to not request a deferment, and then if I got hit by the lottery, I'd go to Canada or maybe just go to Canada directly. And I actually consulted the, the dean of, this was when I was assistant professor, I consulted the dean of the faculty at Princeton. And it must have been my first year as an assistant professor because after that, the dean of the faculty was a physicist who I knew well, and this was not who I was consulting. I consulted 
the then dean of the faculty, and I essentially wanted to know what would happen if I essentially requested a leave of absence to go to some Canadian university because of the Vietnam War situation. I assumed that particularly if I didn't get drafted, that I'd be able to come back when it all was over. And I wanted essentially my position to be held in abeyance that I could come return to it. And he split the baby in half. He said, oh, we'd certainly be willing to give you a leave of absence without pay, but your appointment clock would still run. So you have a three-year appointment. If it ended, well, we, we'd owe you nothing. And I thought about it some more, and I decided that while this would be an elegant gesture, it wouldn't really help you know, the people that I was feeling guilty about wouldn't get help by my gesture. So in the end, I didn't do anything except uh, continue being vocal about the war. In retrospect, how, how risky was that? To ask or how risky was what? To not go. To not go to the can to not go to Canada. It wasn't risky at all because I had this deferment. If I it would have obviously been somewhat risky if I uh, had turned down the deferment, but it depended on the lottery. I don't remember. I you know one did pay attention to whether one's birthday came up, even if one was deferred. And I don't think I my birthday was ever very high. I can't remember now. But that would have been the only risk. Now, was this a point at which you were already asking Shilas about what you might do uh, in this situation? No, no, no. Because, you know, it wasn't the, 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 the Shilas I was asking in those days were, do I keep Shabbos in, if I'm in Japan? When do I keep Shabbos when I'm in Japan? Right. I clearly have religious I was not. No, it was not a plan. Were answer. you aware more generally on what rabbinic guidance might have been in a situation like this? No, and I think it really... I don't think the halach is going to be clear on this. I think it would depend on which rabbi you ask. Right. But, but my guess is my final decision that you're not helping anyone by doing this, so you shouldn't do it, would have been what most rabbis yeah. did. Right, right. Well, it worked out. It did. And, you know, I, I remember I took part in several marches on Washington. Um, it was very. Civil rights, Vietnam was quite a, quite a time in those days. And it was a healthier um, uh, I think it was a healthier political split than we have in the country now because there was at least something behind that you were fighting about real issues. Now somehow it seems as if we're fighting about Irish kind. Of yeah. Splitting the country. Maybe Ukraine will change that a little bit. We'll see. Yeah, I think the Ukraine, it's nice. That's a, although we'll see what happens. Indeed. It's, it's crazy. It is crazy. Well, Barry, let's end on a, on a happy note. The, the other story to pick up, of course, is the Daniel Wells story. We did not finish how your paper went from a single author to two. So what what happened we there? We couldn't have finished because no, to three authors. Actually. To three authors. Oh, right, because and, and, right, the story and, continued and after. Authors. Right, and we couldn't have finished it because because the we we our last interview was in the middle of December. Right, and and the, the dramatic developments I'm going to talk about is in the end of January. Okay, breaking news. So let me let me remind you of some of the background. So when I started writing this book on um, uh, statistical mechanics of lattice gases, phase transitions. It came to this natural question. I discovered, because of some 
references an unpublished thesis of someone named Daniel Wells that had really good ideas that didn't seem to be in the literature and uh, put a version in it in my book. And this, there, would, there was a natural question that his whole framework raised that he clearly had answered one special case of, not that the thesis answered it, but we had a reference to a preprint but there were two other, there was an, the, the, the two cases, one involved um, higher dimensional spins on spheres where he had done two component spins and it was natural to worry about decomponent. And the other was a comparison to um, uh, higher scaleless spins, but we're instead of having spin a half, which is the usual model, spin one, spin three, halves, et cetera. And um, I discovered a, a, a acute argument about uh, doing the multi-component spins. And I, by using his um, ideas, I reduced the other question to a um, algebraic result. For each spin, there was a sequence of inequalities. You needed. For spin one, it was actually false. That was easy to see. But I could do it by hand for spin three halves. And eventually, I did it by hand for spin two. But that took a while. Um, but I was able in Mathematica to compute it. The, 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 for each spin, you had an infinite number of, of inequalities, but you could compute the first few in Mathematica. You could compute in fact, as many as you wanted. But, and Mathematica seemed to suggest these inequalities were true. It was a nice little fact about finite sums that was easy to state clearly seemed to be true, but I couldn't prove it. I actually worked on it with a couple of my co-authors. We made no progress. I consulted another faculty member at Caltech. Um, and in the meantime, I also learned a little more about Daniel Wells. So um, I gave a talk on this stuff, including the conjecture uh, at my 75th birthday conference. And uh, one of the people in the audience was a computer science professor at um, uh, Caltech named Leonard Schulman, who I suspect you know. Um, and about two or three days after my talk, he sent me an email saying, you know, I went to your talk, it was, it was Zoom. It was really very interesting, and I was struck. So I did a little research, and um, he is an Amazon link. It appears Daniel Wells has written a, a chapter from a novel, which he's selling on Amazon. And it's the same Daniel Wells, because he posted a little biographical sketch, and it says he got a PhD. And so maybe you can locate him, and I couldn't figure out from what was posted on Amazon how to locate him. Although in retrospect, he did say he'd gotten a second PhD in computer science from uh, University of Illinois at Urbana. And he'd been a postdoc at Texas A&M and I had consulted, I had friends in math at Texas A&M. I had consulted them to see if any of them could locate any information on him, none of them could, nor could the people at the University of Indiana where he got his uh, uh, math PhD. But I should have probably consulted the computer scientists at University of Illinois, who it turns out do know him, but I didn't. And there are a couple things. There's this and something else that in, that's really new and interesting in, in the book. And you always face the issue when you're writing some book and you make an interesting discovery that's not in the literature. Do you publish a paper on it or don't you? Right? It's going to be in the book eventually, but it's going to take some time and make it buried in the book. 
And generally, I'm not. I don't need to pad my bibliography. So generally, um, uh, I don't publish such things. But one of the things that's happened to me these days is I get, I don't, I think in the last three years, I probably had half a dozen papers I've written. Only one of them has been a, in a regular, ordinary journal. All the others have been either in a, um, uh, a journal issue dedicated to or a separate, an article in a collection of articles published in a book, either in honor of somebody's birthday or in memory of somebody's death. And so one of the things I found that was a cute um, thing uh, was ideal to fit into uh, Journal of Mathematical Physics had an issue in memory of Freeman Dyson. And so I published an article there. And the Wells stuff, I was asked, Elliot, Ber Elliot Lieb is about to have a 90th birthday. I think it's in July of this current year. And I was invited to publish, there's a book coming out in uh, honor of his birthday. And I was invited to, um, to submit an article uh, for this book. And of course, you, you, the, the chances of not getting accepted is essentially zero, but does go through refereeing process. And the, the, the well stuff seemed to be an ideal. Um, and I decided, fine, that I'd write up the, this fit in very nicely because Elliot has a paper that's not totally disconnected from the kinds of questions we're dealing with, I deal with here. So I, I wrote this article. It had a deadline of like January 31st. And it was like January 13th is my memory. Uh, it took about a week and a half to do the write-up uh, because I could cut and paste from the slides of my talk. It was relatively easier to write up than often. And um, I sort of finished the first draft on a Friday and uh, I decided, you know, I, it was really a shame. So the article includes a discussion of the conjecture um, about uh, this general spin, this fun, but the conjecture is just an interesting statement about finite sums and uh, desperate situations require desperate remedies. And I did what in these days is the most natural thing. Um, I wrote an email to Terry Tao. I'll perhaps take a moment telling people who don't know who Terry is, who Please. Terry is not, um, uh, entitled A Challenge, in which I wrote this simple I told him it was connected with the easing model, but here's this finite statement about finite sums. Um, and uh, so Terry is, in my opinion, the world's greatest living mathematician. And there, there are many times in my life I wouldn't have given anyone that name, but Terry really is phenomenal. Um, and among other things, he's not only incredibly broad, he's basically an analyst, but he's done things in logic and number theory. And, uh, but he also is noted as a problem solver. So um, there's a data, in, there's a, a problem in applying Fourier analysis to, to data that um, I'm blanking on the guy's name, but by the time I get the transcript, I'll look it up. But there's a guy who at the time was at Caltech, um, is now at Stanford. And for this work with Terry, 
we got a big prize. Um, but basically what happened is they were both, they met each other in a line, dropping kids, picking up kids after daycare um, because Terry's wife works at, at, Terry's at UCLA, but his wife works at JPL, so they both have kids in the same daycare that's not too far from Caltech. And uh, the, the uh, Caltech professor had uh, asked Terry about this problem he'd been working on for a year. And uh, two hours later, Terry called him with the first draft of the solution that became this incredibly famous, important piece of work. And there are other stories like that. Terry's an incredible problem solver and really fast. So I think it will, maybe. And this, I sent this like at 10 a.m. on a Friday. And after shop is when I logged in, I had an email. It was preliminary solution to the problem. Now, a proof of the conjecture. Now, it wasn't... It, 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 I said it in a way that's dramatic. In fact, it wasn't from Terry. An hour after I wrote to Terry, Terry wrote back and said, that's an interesting, Terry and I know each other, so it isn't as if I came over the transcript. And said, that's sort of interesting problem. I have a postdoc who've been working on inequalities that aren't so different. Why don't I give it to him? And in fact, the postdoc um, had this solution it was very computational and uh, it was three or four pages of, of complicated calculations, which I didn't like. I didn't want to have to go through them all. And we eventually talked some. He's a very interesting guy. He's actually originally from Honduras, um, grew up in poverty and because of the math Olympi Olympiad, got interested in serious math, and there's no place to do it at, at, uh, in Honduras. So he wound up being a graduate student in Rio and did some interesting work that caught Terry's attention. So he's now Terry's postdoc. Um, his postdoc's ending this year, and I just heard from him last week that uh, he's probably going to Virginia Tech when he has an offer. Very interesting guy, very sweet guy, I believe, and very smart because uh, to, he and I together found a, uh, a, a, a relatively simpler way. Of, he had one very good idea, and then to implement it, he had these complicated calculations. We found a way of, uh, I thought, always avoiding the calculations, and then Turned out it only worked in half the cases. So I went back to him and said, I can't get it. And he very quickly found a way around it. He's really very sharp. And so I, uh, it was obvious he should be co-author. So I picked up a co-author, uh, which had this proof of this conjecture as part of the paper. And uh, we, we, I still haven't met him, but we've talked several times on Zoom. And the first time I talked, I gave him some background. I'd sent him the paper. Um, in fact, I sent Pet, 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 Terry the paper originally. And we agreed I should probably work a little bit harder to see if I couldn't locate Daniel Wells. Well, I have... I spend more time than I probably should on Facebook. I have this whole uh, group of friends on Facebook that are mainly mathematicians and physicists, theoretical physicists. A very interesting group. All of us spend too much time chatting. On. So I, I uh, said I, I gave them some, I told them the story about Terry, and of course the typical response was that when I said, well, I had a reply from Terry within 24 hours, one of them was like, well, that's slow for him. Um, so I, I said I was trying to reach Wells. I put the link up on, on Amazon and said, if anyone had any idea how I might reach him. And the next day, there's a graduate student at 
University of Pennsylvania in mathematics, who's part of the, this group. It's not a formal group, but it's all Facebook friends. Or it's, uh, and he said, I, I actually like to think that I'm a good internet sleuth. And here's what I think his address is. And here are some email addresses for what I think is your Daniel Wells. And so I sent an email to this. I said, you know, if you're not the right Daniel Wells, uh, please ignore this. But I'm trying to reach the Daniel Wells who's such and such. And it turned out to be the right Daniel Wells, um, who essentially had it's a sad story he, he wrote up his thesis and submitted the preprint that Eisenman and I had quoted uh, and it got rejected and if he'd had you know that's the point where an advisor says sure journals often reject papers just send it to another journal but unfortunately actually before he even took his final exam, his advisor had passed away, so he didn't really have a close advisor, and so he just gave up and decided to leave mathematics and never followed up with the paper. But he, in the end, would agree to be a co-author. So suddenly, in a period of five days, I went from a single authored paper to three authors. Um, and, you know, Wells, Part of my paper was describing his thesis. So he finally got his thesis published. Um, and it's, it's, and it's a nice paper and it's a great story because, and you know, and the, the, the point is one can describe the, the proof at least in the half of the cases where you don't need this calculation in a talk. So it makes it, you know, make an ideal talk and it's gonna be a fun talk because it's a nice piece of mathematics, a nice, um, with an application to physics and, and, uh, and a nice backstory. Barry, we already talked about your plans for the future. Given these developments, does that change anything for you? No. I'm still working on the book. This is just, no, no. This is. It's a nice story about colleagues and the good work that they can do. Correct. And it really is a joint. You know, it's a, it's a strange, you know, it, it, joint papers are really like this, but, right, Wells did his work in 1978, I think, and really didn't contribute anything after that. And I had this intense period about a year ago, and then uh, Jose Madrid, who's the third author, did this work. So it's not, we never, well, Madrid and I did simplify it. So we did work jointly, but it's, it's three people putting together. It's a nice, it's a nice story about how academia can work sometimes. <laughs> well, Barry, on that note, I'm so glad we reconnected to tie up these loose threads. Happy Purim. Have a wonderful time in Israel. Yes, I plan to. <laughs>